Thank you, worship team. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to those of you sitting here in the room, and a special welcome if you're watching live or on demand at a later point in time. If we haven't met yet, my name is Scott Newman. I am the associate pastor here at Santa Cruz Bible Church, and we're continuing this morning a series that we're calling The Game of Life. And, uh, you know, we're not, you know, moving chess pieces or little, you know, cars along a board. Um, we're talking about how our life in Jesus, following Jesus, impacts every aspect of our lives and what the implications are. And so uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about money. Now, before you, you know, decide to check out or, you know, uh, be more interested in the sports scores on your device um, or walk out the back, um, because I know talking about money is super awkward. Um, in fact, there's, there's, most of us would rather openly talk about our sex lives than we would like to talk about money. So, but the reality is that money consumes so much of our thought life and our time and our attention. It, it's, it's, like the, it's like the water that we're constantly swimming in. And so it's something that we have to figure out how do we navigate this and, and in a sense, find freedom from this as we're followers of Jesus. So as I was getting ready for this message this week, I was remembering how um, we've been here in Santa Cruz a little over 11 years now. And uh, when we first got hired, or when I first got hired, um, they told us, um, jump on the housing market because rental, the rental market is crazy. Uh, and this was 11 years ago. I mean, it's like 10 times worse now. But they're like, if you find anything that you think might work, jump on it, like right away. So we're like, okay. So we, you know, go back to our hotel room that night. You know, we're staying at the Best Western on 41st, you know, on our candidating trip. And we start, like, we jump on Craigslist and all these sites that night. We're like, okay, I guess we got to find something. So came up with a list. I flew out again, like, a week later. And... Uh, did a bunch of open houses, uh, you know, several were like really scary, sketchy places, like, um, or they were like nice, but too small. And then I walked into an open house at, you know, what, what became our house currently, and I just knew right away, like, this place is perfect. It's got room for us to um, expand our family. It's got room for us to have community over. We really care about hosting groups and having people in our home, and it gave us space to do all that. I knew it was perfect. So I, I grabbed the application, went back, started filling it out, turned it in, and they're like, um, yeah, so your income needs to be three times more than, than rent. And it turns out my income was not three times more than rent. <laughs> in fact, the, the, the rent for this place was a thousand dollars more than the last place we had rented up in Washington State for the same amount of space. So that was Santa Cruz for you. And again, keep in mind, this was 11 years ago. So we're like, okay, I, I guess this isn't the place for us. So end up finding another place, smaller place, but it would work and applied. We were number one on the list. We were supposed to get it and then get a call from the rental office saying, hey, the, the landlord went with the number two on the list, like out of nowhere. So we're, we're like, what? That doesn't make any sense, but okay, I, I, guess, I guess our house is still out there somewhere. So another few days go by and then we see pop up on, on um, Craigslist again, the house that, we had, that I had toured and that we had applied for already. And we're like, oh, that means that they, they didn't rent it yet. Maybe they'd be willing to work with us. So we call them. We say, hey, this is the deal. I already saw it. We already applied. This is the conversation we had. This is how much I make. My wife also, at the time, uh, did, you know, kind of had some side hustles. So we're like, would you count that income in? And they're like, okay. They end up giving it to us. So, so we got our house, and it's literally a miracle that we got it. We're still there 11 years later. And immediately, we were just like so excited. We're like, yes, we're moving to Santa Cruz. We have a place by the beach. Like, this is going to be amazing. And then really quickly, just the reality sets in of like, oh my God, how are we going to pay for this? <laughs> how, how are we going to make ends meet? And that's a struggle. So money is one of those things that, like I said, is completely unavoidable. 
Because money and finance is the water that we're literally swimming in. And even those who try to escape the reality of money, like let's say you just like, are like, I'm done with money, I'm gonna like go into the wilderness and live off the grid and all that kind of stuff. Your, your life is still defined by money. You, you're defined by the rejection of it, but it's still defining your life. It's inescapable. So that's why so many of us show up day after day to jobs that we tolerate, often barely, to keep the paychecks coming so that we can pay the bills and fund our kids' activities and maybe even once in a blue moon, like, I don't know, pay for something that like I actually want to do. Like, maybe once in a while I can afford a coffee. I don't know. Um, and then for those of us in the room who are millennials, it's been, yes, it's been a rough go for us. <laughs> Many of us were graduating college or grad school right as the economy collapsed. Remember that? 2008, 2009, and we woke up one morning and we're like, well, our bank doesn't exist anymore. That's interesting. Um, so we didn't get the start in the working world, in the financial world, that maybe some previous generations got to enjoy. And then we started having kids and the pandemic hits and many of us, many of our lives were dramatically impacted by uh, the lockdowns and the, just the changing reality of our world. There were layoffs, and many of us were impacted financially by all of that. So it's been hard for us not to have money on our minds. And then when you remember that living here in Santa Cruz, we are living in, um, for the second year in a row, Santa Cruz County was named the most expensive county to live in in the country. I'm not joking, right? There was a report that was published this summer by the National Low-Income Housing Coalition. So it's not just in our heads. Like, it's, it's real. It's, it's hard to make it here. And I know that as much as I love Santa Cruz, unless God just works a miracle, like, I'm never going to own a home here. Like, we're lucky to hang on to our rental for the moment. So, so yet again, we're fighting for survival, and we're struggling to make ends meet. And so it's hard not to just have money dominate so much of our attention throughout the day. I think many of us, in light of this reality, if we're honest, we would love to have a little relief, a little bit of freedom from worrying about money. And Jesus reminds us in Matthew's gospel that money can end up being like kind of a rival to God. And, and the thing about money, or really any other rival to God, is that it's a terrible master. Money, just like any other idol, it will promise you the world, but then it will beat you up, and eventually, given enough time, it's going to destroy you. And, and I think we all recognize this at some deep level, that money can never truly satisfy us. It can never truly deliver on the promise that it offers. No matter how much fun it is to buy that new car or buy that jet ski or take that trip to Europe and not knocking any of those things, but they will never ultimately deliver on the promise of true happiness and safety and security in the world. And so we need to find freedom. Now there's, there's a kind of freedom that comes from wise financial stewardship. And, and that's a really great thing. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to share an opportunity at the end of the message today um, for us to pursue that. Um, but I think that there's actually even a deeper level of freedom that Jesus wants for each of us. And it's the kind of freedom that the Apostle Paul describes in his letter to the church at Philippi. This is the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. The Apostle Paul says... I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. That sounds like real freedom. To be content whether your emergency fund is full or whether it's... Uh, <laughs> whether it's accumulating overdraft fees, <laughs> to uh, whether you're door dashing your dinner every night or whether it's rice and beans or top ramen for the fifth night in a row. 
That sounds like real freedom. And this is the kind of freedom that's so important for us to cultivate in our lives. Because when we have this kind of freedom, really deep interior freedom, we're free to love. And we're free to join Jesus in the healing and liberating and saving of the world. So how do we find this kind of freedom? Well, we begin with the reality that, that money itself is neutral. What matters ultimately is the orientation of our hearts. So remember all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. In the book of Genesis, God creates the world and everything in it. Plants, animals, people. And he says, everything is very good. God created everything very good. And so in one way or another, money is a part of God's good creation. But things begin to go sideways when we use anything, including money, in a way that goes against God's desires for the flourishing of all things. So that's why the Apostle Paul, again, quoting him, can say in his, in his first letter to his godson, Timothy, this is 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. He says, those who want to get rich fall into, into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Many, many of you, I'm sure, have heard the, the, the saying that money is the root of all evil. Well, it's a misquotation of this passage that we just read. And Paul doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. He says, what? The love of money is the root of all evil. So money is not the problem. It's the love of money. And what Paul means by that is trusting money to keep you safe and secure, to provide you a happy future. And it's when we love money in that way, when we trust money to, to hold our future safe and secure, that's when things begin to go off the rails. So one of the best examples of, of the place that money or really anything has in our life comes from um, one of my favorite 16th century reformers, um, a man named Ignatius of Loyola. This is what he called his, his principle and foundation. It's a little long, so bear with me. Um, but I think it's really important because it just explains this so succinctly and clearly. So Ignatius said, God who loves us and creates us and wants, God who loves us creates us and wants to share life with us forever. Our love response takes shape in our praise and honor and service of the God of our life. So what is the meaning of life? It's to be loved by God and to make a return of love to God, to love and be loved. So he goes on to say, all the things in this world are also created because of God's love, and they become a context of gifts presented to us so that we can know God more easily and make a return of love more readily. So everything in life, anything you come across, anything, anyone, is an opportunity for you to, one, experience God's love, whether it's a hard thing or whether it's an easy thing, whether it's something you enjoy or whether it's something you despise. It's an opportunity to experience God's love, but more than that, not just experience God's love, but grow in the ability to love, to have God's love overflow out of and through our lives. So Ignatius goes on to say, as a result, we show reverence for all the gifts of creation and collaborate with God in using them so that by being good stewards, we develop as loving persons in our care for God's world and its development. But if we abuse any of these gifts of creation, or on the contrary, take them as the center of our lives, we break our relationship with God and hinder our growth as loving persons. So everything is, a, is an opportunity for us to experience God's love. But when we take these things that we're given as gifts to lead us to God and make them the ultimate thing, that's when things begin to go sideways. So what's the solution? Ignatius says, in everyday life then, we must hold ourselves in balance before all created gifts, insofar as we have a choice and are not bound by some responsibility. We should not fix our desires on health or sickness, wealth or poverty, success or failure, a long life or a short one, and this is the key, for everything has the potential of 
calling forth in us a more loving response to our life forever with God. Our only desire and our one choice should be this. I want and I choose what better leads to God's deepening life in me. So money, just like anything else, is not bad. It's a part of God's good creation. It's a part of God's gift to us. Money is an opportunity to experience God's love and grow in our ability to love, whether we have money or whether we have negative money. Having money or not having money can both serve God's purposes to allow us to experience his love and offer that love back to the world. So when our desires center on money, though, rather than on God. That's when things go wrong in our personal lives. And that's not just when things go wrong in our personal lives, but that's when things like injustice and exploitation happen in the world. Because instead of money being an opportunity to experience and offer love, it becomes an end in and of itself. And people end up serving that end. And we oppress and exploit and abuse people in that end. So what does it look like to live in the way that Ignatius talks about and Paul talks about, to be content whether we have a lot or whether we have little? Well, Ignatius told a story about this that I think is is really kind of helpful for really understanding what does this actually look like. So he, he told a story about three kinds of people. So as the story goes, three different people acquire a sum of money that in today's dollars would be worth somewhere around 300 million. So, a lot of money, right? Um, And each of these three people genuinely wants to honor God and be free of the love of money. However, each handles the money very differently. So, the first person, I I nicknamed this guy the I'll get around to it person. (laughs) This person genuinely wants to honor God and be free and yet they procrastinate and never get around to it in their lifetime. And it, you know, we're not judging this person, but the reality is that at the same time, they, they didn't get to experience the fullness of what God wanted for them. So that's the first person, the I'll get around to it person. The second person, I call this the I wanna be free, but not that much person. So this person also wants to overcome their excessive attachment to money and will even take practical steps to get there. However, their commitment only goes so far and they're not ultimately willing to part with their money. So they may give money to their church, they may give money to the the poor and to charities, they may be very generous with their money, but ultimately they're not willing to let go of it. If you remember the story of the rich young ruler, This is that kind of person. So this is the, I want to be free, but not that much. The third person, this is the, I want to be free no matter what kind of person. Now, when we think about this person, this is the person that when when we hear about this, we assume, well, they want to be free no matter what, and so they're going to just give their money away, right? But, But that's not actually what freedom necessarily looks like. This is a person who becomes so free in God's love that they are willing to do with the money whatever God asks of them. So this might mean giving it away. It might mean keeping it. Or it might mean using it to love and to serve others. Dean Brackley writes of this third person. He he says, those in the third group place their wealth in what he calls psychological escrow. They place themselves in God's hands and strive to conduct themselves with this wealth with complete interior freedom. It's then that they discern what they should do with the money to bring about the greatest good overall. So when we're free in regards to our money, it doesn't mean that we're automatically just selling everything we have and giving it to the poor. It just means that we're so secure in God's love that we're able to seek God's direction for what we do with our money, and we're completely okay with whatever God asks us to do. 
Now, this might sound good to you, or it might sound a little different. (laughs) But you're probably wondering either way, how in the world does anyone get to this point where they're able to be that free with their money? I think we have to begin with the reality that God loves us, and he loves to take care of us. Listen to how Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 to 11. Jesus said, which of you, if your son or daughter asks for bread, will give them a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give them a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to, good, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? See, we can get so anxious about making sure that we and our families have enough to survive. Uh, I I get it. I live this reality every day. And in fact, we want to make sure that that we have more than enough money to survive. And we want to have enough for a rainy day. And in our society, one of the best, if not the best ways to do that is to just amass a lot of money. But we often do this while at the same time forgetting that God loves to provide good gifts to his children. Now, this isn't just something nice to say about God. It, it's one thing to say it and have it sound good, right? But how do we know that this is actually true? And we know this because God in Jesus has given us everything. Listen again to how the Apostle Paul puts it. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, remember, Paul's not talking necessarily about Jesus making us all literally rich and giving us lots of money, right? We're We're not talking prosperity gospel here. What he's saying is that Jesus, in his life and in his death and in his resurrection, satisfies your deepest longing and my deepest longing. He frees us from the fear of death. He frees us from everything that oppresses us. He frees us from everything that can block the flow of love in our lives so that we can richly receive God's love and that we can overflow in that love to every single person that we encounter in our everyday lives. So I want to ask, how have you experienced God's provision? Because I bet you have some stories. Oftentimes, people like to get up here and talk about these big grand stories of how God's provided for them. And maybe you have some of those. Um, God's been really good to us. I mean, we're still here. Um, We've had to get really, really good at budgeting. (laughs) And really, really good at knowing where our money goes. And um, somehow we're still here. Somehow we're still living in Santa Cruz. Somehow we still have cars and can still put gas in our cars and we can buy clothes and we can, you know, send our kids to to activities and stuff like that. Um, we're, We're not living high on the hog, that's for sure. But God somehow has provided for us and kept us here. And I don't, you know, if I'm honest, I don't know all the ways that that necessarily has worked. I don't know necessarily how all those ends have met. But we're here, and we're surviving. And God's allowed us to carve out a really good life here in Santa Cruz. And I bet in one way or another that you have a story of God providing for you in a similar way. And so through Jesus, God has saved you and freed you and liberated you. And he's demonstrated in one way or another in your life his intention to richly bless you and to care for you. And when we're able to receive that kind of love, we can then overflow in that love. And money is yet one more way in which we can demonstrate God's love. Once we've been freed by his love, we can use whatever wealth we have in order to show love to others. So Paul, again, talks about this dynamic in his letter to the, to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 11. He tells them, And God is able to bless you abundantly, 
so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So the way Paul imagines it, whatever resources God has provided us, those are gifts that we can use to seek the welfare and the flourishing of others. So I want to ask, in what ways might Jesus be inviting you into freedom, especially with your money, so that you can love others and seek their flourishing? I want to talk for a minute just about what this looks like for us as a church. Um, as you know, or maybe you don't know, you're new here, um, our, we have a vision of being a place of hope for everyone. We believe that the hope of Jesus is literally for everyone. And lots of churches will say that. Um, what many of you have experienced in those churches is that um, there's a cutoff point at which, well, we say everyone, but we really don't mean everyone. And we're working really, really, really hard as a church. We don't do it perfectly. I recognize that. We're working really, really hard to be a place where the love of Jesus and hope found in Jesus is extended to everyone. No questions asked. And so we do that in all kinds of different ways. I mean, you see it here on Sundays in the way that Matt and I and Dawn and others teach uh, you see it in classes. We're, we're doing a, a class right now on Wednesday nights for those that have experienced religious trauma and abuse. We believe that uh, if you've experienced trauma in, 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 in any sh sphere of life, but especially in church spaces, that we need to talk about that openly. And we need to talk about what does healing look like. And we're, we're, we're doing our best as a church to organize and train and be aware in such a way that if you've experienced trauma, that this is a safe place for you, where you're not going to come on Sunday or come on Wednesday or come to a community group um, and get unnecessarily triggered. Um, we're doing this in the ways that we reach out to our community. Uh, Matt talks all the time about how we're the second largest food pantry in the county. Um, and we didn't even set out to, to do that. We just set out to try to serve people, especially during the pandemic and beyond, who were struggling. But, but listen to this. We, we got word from Second Harvest, who's our, our um, food distribution partner, that in August, Santa Cruz Bible Church, through our food pantries, we served 1,378 families in our community. And that worked out to about 3,588 individuals served as a result of our food pantry that otherwise might be um, subject to some sort of food insecurity. Um, we have partnerships both in town and then globally around the world because we believe in listening to Jesus with the finances that he's provided to us through, through your generous giving and asking Jesus not what makes best sense to us, what makes the most strategic sense? Not even, although we want to listen, we want to pay attention to what wise financial stewardship says, but most importantly, as a church, as a leadership team, as a board of elders, we're saying, how do we steward these resources in the way that Jesus asks us to? In the way that I'm inviting us into freedom, holding ourselves in balance before money and saying, money isn't what we're after. Jesus is what we're after. And then in, in listening to Jesus' invitation, that's what we're trying to do as a church. And so as, as you're discerning, where is Jesus' voice inviting you to use your money and to invest in money? Where is Jesus inviting you to use your money to do good? We recognize that Santa Cruz Bible is not the only place that you can or maybe even should invest your money. But, but I just want to say that if this is a place where Jesus leads you to invest in what we're doing, to make possible what we're doing and more, we have dreams for so much more 
here in Santa Cruz County, to see Jesus do really, truly incredible things, to see the kingdom of God as Jesus envisioned it happen. And that won't be just the Santa Cruz Bible Church thing, but we want to be a significant part of that work of what Jesus is doing. We want to invite you to be a part of that. Jennifer at the end is going to um, talk about giving, but you can give to Santa Cruz Bible and, and, and what we're doing if Jesus leads you online, the, the old-fashioned way, by check, cash. There's kiosks scattered around the room. And you can also, you know, give via Venmo, so the new-fashioned way. Um, I also want to say that, um, as I said at the beginning, financial stewardship is um, a really helpful part of this process. Um, it's not the ultimate freedom, because I think Jesus wants an even deeper kind of freedom for us. But many of us, um, <laughs> one of the things that's crazy is that in schools, they, they don't really teach us this, or at least not anymore. I don't know if they used to. But um, so starting next month, we're going to offer um, a two-Sunday financial faith and finances seminar. So uh, Andres Bocoletti, um, who is a part of our church, um, he's often up here giving announcements. He's a certified financial um, educator. And so he's going to be leading us uh, in a two-week class in November. Uh, it's going to be after church, 1130 to 1. Um, and it's going to be just leading us through some of the basic principles of financial stewardship. Um, because if, um, if, if, or if our finances are just a mess and we've never been taught um, or we don't know what to do, it's really hard to find that space of interior freedom. But the more we can be disciplined um, to use our money well and to use our money wisely, it creates space, not for us to just amass a whole bunch of wealth necessarily, but it creates space in which to finally hear the voice of Jesus freeing us from our worries about money, freeing us from our worries about the future, and inviting us into something deeper and more holistic, his love. So I want to invite you uh, to join us on November 10th and 17th. Uh, you can sign up um, online via the link tree, uh, which you can get to via the uh, QR code, which is on the back of your seat in front of you. Now, as we finish today, we have an opportunity um, together to, to engage in an embodied practice that reminds us of the ways in which God has come and met all of our needs. Um, I, can, I can stand up here uh, all, day, all day long. Uh, none of you would be here anymore, but I could keep talking all day long <laughs> about how good God is and about what God has done. But one of the things that Jesus left us was a practice in which we wouldn't just be hearing about this, but that we can experience this and engage in this together. Um, and that is the practice of communion. And so um, on either side of the room and then in the back in the center, there are some tables with the communion elements. And um, as Lizzie and the band come and lead us in a final song, I want to invite you, uh, when you're ready, uh, you can get up and receive the elements, the bread and the, the little cup of juice, um, and take it back to your seat and hold it. And then after the song, we will receive those elements together. So would you join me in prayer? Holy Three, we thank you for Jesus who was born among us incognito, who grew up without privilege or status, who walked the way to heaven through the back streets of the world, who told the deepest truths in ordinary language, who touched and healed, blessed and disturbed without fear or favor, who showed inclusive love in all its unconditional glory, who for all this was crucified, died, and was buried, and who for all this and for all of us rose again, who though high in heaven is present with us here and now. So God, beyond holiness, as we do this morning what Jesus once did, let your spirit move among us and settle on this bread and this cup that they may become for us our true spiritual food. And let that same spirit stir our souls so that as we share this sacrament, we may recognize our Lord and receive him, that he may be in us and we in him forever. Amen.